tonight for this great presentation. We're all really looking forward to it. So I appreciate your time. I'm going to go ahead and begin tonight's recording with a land acknowledgement. So this webinar takes place on Ndokna, which translates to our homelands that is now called New Hampshire and Vermont. Ndokna is the unceded traditional ancestral homelands and waterways of the Penacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land, water, air, flora, and fauna, and the human beings who have stewarded Ndokna throughout the generations for over 12,000 years. Tonight, um, some of our community partners are co-sponsoring this event. So a huge thank you goes out to the New Hampshire Medical Society, New Hampshire Academy of Family Physicians, New Hampshire Public Health Association, New, New Hampshire Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Geisel Chapter of the Medical Students for a Sustainable Future, and Dartmouth College's Climate Health Alliance. So thank you all to those organizations. And then tonight introducing our speaker and moderating the Q&A after the presentation is going to be Jacinta Palak. She is a medical student at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, and she is a member of New Hampshire Healthcare Workers for Climate Action's Board of Directors. So Jess, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you everybody for joining us here today. I just want to introduce our presenter today. Her name is Carly Hampshire. She's a fourth year medical student at the University of California, San Francisco, applying to residency in internal medicine. And she founded the Planetary Health Report Card Initiative in 2019 and served as the initiative's co-director until this summer when she pivoted into the role of partnerships chair. Carly is also the curriculum chair for Medical Students for a Sustainable Future, a lead of the Climate Resources for Health Education Initiative, a current Schweitzer Fellow, and a member of the National Academy of Medicine Action Collaborative on Decarbonizing the U.S. Health Sector. Carly, thank you so much for joining us here today and for taking the time during your busy application uh, season to talk with us. We're really excited to hear from you. Thank you so much, Jess. And I'll go ahead and share my screen. Perfect. Can I get a thumbs up that you all can see that? Awesome. Um, it's great to be here with you today. Um, and thanks so much for the invitation to speak. So as just mentioned, my name is Carly Hampshire and I'm a medical student at UCSF. Excited to talk with you today about the Planetary Health Report, Report Card Initiative that um, I co-founded back in 2019. Um, and the motivation for this report card is really born out of the photo and the backdrop of the slide. So this is what this guy looked like when I started medical school in the fall of 2019 or 2018 as the campfire was raging in Northern California. Um, even if you were not in California at the time, which I imagine most of you or not being from New Hampshire, um, you might have seen pictures like this on the news. It was a pretty apocalyptic, eerie site that made national and international news. But even though we were walking to school every day in N95 masks, breathing in some of the worst quality air in the world, there was really a disconnect between what we were learning in the classroom and what was going on in the outside world. Um, our lecturers did not acknowledge the health of air pollution or wildfire smoke in our curriculum which was especially notable given that we were ironically um, in the pulmonary block at the time. And I soon found out that other students were also disillusioned with this lack of climate change in the medical school curriculum. So in a student survey of about 600 medical students across the country that we led, 84% um, believed that climate health was needed in the core curriculum but only 13% believed that their medical school was providing adequate education on the topic. And perhaps even most striking was that only 6% of the students we surveyed felt, quote unquote, very prepared to discuss climate change and health of the patient. And this lack of confidence in communicating climate change and health is a problem because we know, um, based on research led by Ed Maybach and others, that health professionals are some of the most trusted sources for climate health information, more than sometimes even the CDC and, and climate scientists. So patients want us to have this information, but the truth is that health professionals are really not trained to understand, manage, or mitigate the health consequences of climate change. Luckily though, there is a lot of emerging momentum to understand and address this gap. 
And one source of momentum has been the Planetary Health Report Card Initiative, which is a student-led metric-based initiative to increase planetary health engagement in health professional schools um, that we co-founded back in 2019. And the report card catalyzes student-led teams to conduct planetary health need assessments um, at their medical schools and evaluate their institution on various metrics that we outline. So students can work with faculty and administrators to then address the gaps identified, um, gaining inspiration from the efforts at other schools through our report card repository, idea sharing events like the Institutional Advocacy Workshop and Symposium, and our pretty active online community. And the report card is divided into five different sections. So we have curriculum, research, community outreach and advocacy, support for student initiatives, and campus sustainability with some examples of metrics that might appear in each of those section, sections shown here. And these metrics were initially drafted with the help of over a dozen experts around the world, as well as a review of previous published competencies. And the metrics have been iteratively refined over time, especially as we've grown internationally and have had to consider international generalizability in the metrics. So for each metric, students select a point here and write out an explanation of why that point here was selected with links to associated resources when applicable, such that the report card can serve not only as a scoring tool, but also as a comprehensive for those interested in exploring the institution's planetary health offerings. And I'll say like, as I've been applying to residency, it's been useful to scroll through with some of these report cards um, and see, oh, what sorts of centers and opportunities might exist at, at each of the programs that I'm applying to. So what does it actually look like for schools to participate in this report card process and implement these metrics? So the annual cycle occurs along the academic year and all of the teams that participate follow this same timeline as one big large community. Um, in August and September, our regional leads recruit schools in their region and help students at those schools build a team. In October, we host a mandatory orientation that describes implementation process and allow students to meet the hundreds of students completing the report card alongside them. And we actually just held our orientation this past Saturday and it was pretty incredible the turnout. There were over a hundred students in attendance and in my breakout room of just 12 people or so, there was representation from medical students in Switzerland, Canada, the UK, US, as well as nursing and pharmacy leads, all committed to donating their limited free time to the cause of improving planetary health. And then after orientation from November to February, the student-led teams with faculty mentorship complete the report metrics, um, eliciting input from administration, faculty, and staff. And from February to March, our leadership team then reviews the report cards for consistency and, and level of detail, working with the different teams to modify the report cards if necessary. And then finally, everything culminates in Earth Day. Um, on Earth Day, we release an annual report that summarizes all the school scores and highlights examples of innovative ways that schools have met the metrics to hopefully inspire cross-pollination of ideas. And when we started this initiative in 2019 as a pilot at UCSF and Stanford, we didn't know much if there would be student interest, but the initiative quickly grew to include 13 medical schools in 2020 to 62 medical schools last year. And for this last year's cycle, we translated the report card into German, French, Japanese, um, and had teams at 74 medical schools in the US, UK, Canada, Ireland, Germany, and Japan, um, plus pilots published for nursing and pharmacy led by students in those disciplines. And this, um, this year we continue to keep on growing. So we've expanded the report card scope to include additional schools and countries, including Australia, New Zealand, Switzerland, South Africa, Portugal, Turkey, Greece, Netherlands, I think, um, plus some other ones that I might be missing. And we're working on pilots for dentistry and physical therapy as well with students in those disciplines. And one of my mentors, um, Teddy Potter, likes to share the proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I hope this type of interprofessional collaboration will keep on propelling the movement even further. 
and there's a map of some of the participating schools from last year. And then of course, people always wanna know how the report card has helped catalyze real change since that's the end goal here. And though we haven't historically done a great job of collecting comprehensive data on that, continuing to, to work on that, um, we do know that as a result of involvement with the report card, many schools have developed planetary health task forces or boards, some have launched student groups or environmental electives, and others have had lasting permanent changes made to their curricula. So to zoom in on future directions a little bit more, what are we thinking for the future of the report card? We're hoping to continue expanding the report card scope to additional medical schools and countries, as I mentioned. And then we're also working with teams in the different health professions to expand the report card into those settings. And eventually the goal in that regard would be to construct interprofessional collaborative teams that can fill out the overla overlapping parts of the report cards together and then advocate for change together. Especially since at any given institution, there tends to be only a few students interested in this sort of thing. And so to the extent that you can crowdsource people in the different disciplines, I think it will be all the more powerful. And then lastly, in the interest of pairing problems with solutions, we hope to offer resources that lower the activation energy for addressing some of the gaps identified. So for example, I don't know why they keep automatically going, but for example, we're collaborating on the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education's Climate Resources for Health Education Initiative. That was like a lot of words, but basically it's an effort to create an open access expert reviewed climate and health curriculum repository for medical education. And in the template that we just offered to teams this year, um, launched at orientation, we mapped the cases and slides that have been published by that initiative thus far to metrics on the same topic. So it's like a problem solution, one, two punch pairing, and then the activation energy to address the gaps is, is lowered. And then I should also mention um, that the Climate Resources for Health Education project is still actively seeking faculty reviewers and advisors with climate and health expertise, as well as students who are interested in developing curricular content. So I can post that link in the chat in case any of you are interested in, in helping with that. It's an ongoing um, rollout. And a lot of what we try and do with the report card is to crowdsource information on what are the barriers that you're encountering with integrating this content, and then what are some of the best practices you found for overcoming them? Like how can we learn from each other's experiences so that in the future, some of that work is less challenging? And with that goal in mind, we'll share some of what we've learned. So first, barriers. A lot of the barriers are related to lack of resources, lack of faculty expertise, lack of funding, lack of curricular space. And from the student side, um, as I'm sure Jess can attest to, there's also this sense of, I already have to learn so much to become a health professional. There's already this fire hose of information coming at me. Like, how can I add this to when it's not even tested on licensing exams? So some of the best practices that we found for addressing those barriers are one, integrating climate and health into existing curricula. So where you're already learning about vector-borne diseases, can you throw in a slide or two about the changing geographic distribution of vectors due to climate change? And where you're already talking about structural determinants of health, um, can you use redlining and heat as an example? So this curricula doesn't require brand new standalone lectures. And in fact, we found it's more effective if it's integrated because it's not as existentially overwhelming for students um, and it's better reflective of the broad pervasive health consequences of climate change. Um, so integrated is best. And then faculty and student co-production of knowledge is also helpful. So students can bring energy and a valuable student perspective and faculty can bring clinical knowledge and longevity, ensuring that any curricular transformation that happens to be born out of institutional advocacy and report card engagement um, is sustainable. It's not just going to go away in a couple of years. And another facilitator is thinking about how institutions can crowdsource curricular materials when possible, catalyzing more urgent curricular transformation and avoiding having to reinvent the wheel in different places, especially given that many institutions don't yet have faculty experts in climate and health. And I feel like the climate and health space is uniquely collaborative. I've really loved working with people 
in all different sectors and all different institutions here. It's not as traditionally siloed um, as a lot of academia can be. And then lastly, getting top-down support within your institution from people like your curriculum deans helps to overcome the barriers. And at a larger scale with top-down support, um, I know pediatrics among perhaps other specialties has been a leader in obtaining some top-down support nationally, getting this content included in licensing exams and formal accreditation requirements. Hopefully other specialties will continue to do that as well. Um, so that's all I have. I know that was a whirlwind tour of the initiative, but um, I'll stop there for now and look forward to answering your questions. Carly, thank you so much. Um, it's really great to hear from you and hear how the Planetary Health Report card got started. Um, I think that opening slide was really striking for me with just that image of how smoky it was. And I guess I didn't really put together that you were you know, going to school in an environment, learning about human health and walking out and having to breathe in all that smoke at the same time. So I'm glad that you were able to turn that experience into something that is so productive, um, not just for your school, but now expanding to include all these other medical schools, not just throughout the US, but kind of throughout the world now. So that's really great. I know at Geisel, we have only done the planetary health report card twice. So uh, 2020 and 2021, and then 2021 to 2022. Um, our first year doing it, our overall score was a D, unfortunately. We did improve last year to get a C minus. Um, and across those five disciplines, we were generally improving. Unfortunately, we did have some regression in the support for student-led initiatives category. And I'm just wondering, um, I guess, in your experience and sort of seeing how other schools have navigated this process, what do you think is the best way to leverage the Planetary Health Report card in order to gain support from administration and you know, try and incorporate more of this material into our curriculum and extracurricular activities too. Yeah, that's a great question, Jacinta. And I'm glad that you've been able to just participate over a couple of years now and have seen overall improvement, even if the support for student initiatives category has regressed a bit. Um, and in conjunction with the template that we provide to all the team, teams as you know we have a user guide and in that user guide we recommend that the different teams schedule a meeting with their dean or other sort of administrative leadership to discuss the results of what they find in their evaluation and um when presenting those results often the like 45 page document that comes out of the report card can be a little bit overwhelming it's helpful to create some sort of cover sheet of these are my three things that I really would love to see my institution do. Um, and how can we like work together to make this happen? And even if it's just three things one year, then perhaps the next year you chip away at more and more of the metrics and make more change. Um, and we've heard from schools that have participated in the report card multiple years in a row that every year it gets easier and easier to work with administration. And every year people are more receptive to it and see it as a good thing that the school is participating in rather than a punitive thing. So I would just say, you know, keep with it. <laughs> and even if it's not in your time um, at Geisel, then perhaps you can pave the way for future leaders. Thank you for that answer. It has been pretty exciting to see how even you know the first year medical students who are entering Geisel this year are coming in with more excitement about incorporating climate change and climate health into the curriculum. So I'm hoping that this just kind of continues to increase. Um, we do have a question in the chat and for all of our listeners, feel free to also pose your questions in the chat. Um, Carl, would you, are you interested in unmuting to ask your question to Carly? Sure, um, I'd be happy to. Carly, thank you so much for um, uh, taking the time to present um, this incredible work to us. And um, I wondered if, if, if some of the um, 
uh, sort of tools that you're using could be elevated to be uh, focused on accreditation bodies of medical schools or to be uh, uh, moving towards incorporating um, planetary health uh, items in uh, the national examinations that um, young professionals have to take. I know pediatrics is, as you mentioned, has done uh, some work in this area, but I, I wondered about the more general, uh, you know, general areas. Yeah, that's a great question. I think having that top-down support would really help catalyze more expeditious transformation of curricula at multiple different levels. Um, we haven't had much success from our organization thus far in advocating with the LCME, for instance, um, here in the US, although I know others are working on that. Maybe, maybe you're one of them. Um, but in the UK, a lot of the students who work on the project have actually worked with their, um, I forget exactly what their board is called, but the equivalent of the LCME there um, and wrote an open letter, collected lots of signatures, um, and I think have had some success in making that change. And there is now a learning objective or competency on the list of what is required for graduating medical students in the UK that has something to do with environmental um, like degradation and health consequences, as well as climate smart healthcare. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you for that question, Carl, and for that answer, Carly. Um, Diane Riley had a comment, I think, to the question that I posed earlier. Diane, are you in a position where you can unmute and maybe um, share your comment with us? Yeah, I'm, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and uh, I went through Dartmouth for everything but my hand surgery. And I think you, I'm very excited that you guys are doing this. I think you need to know that this is a issue for the alumni. Um, I was talking to one of my guys' old classmates who is in Massachusetts and actually sent her the link. It's also, I'm a surgeon. This is pertinent every single day. Uh, and it, it is part of the papers that are getting published and presented in national organizations, cost value analysis and waste in the operating room, the viability of, of procedures. So I, I think it's, it's got to be intrinsic in the DNA of every type of course you take. And you've, you're right, you've got to go top down, have a mission statement and get it passed through the, uh, get it passed through whatever is the equivalent of the board of governors for the, for the med school. It's my suggestion. Absolutely. And I'm really glad you brought up the sustainability of surgical care. That was one of the metrics we added this year. So as I mentioned, every year we kind of look at the metrics and say, is there anything that needs to be changed? Anything that we should add based on feedback? And every year that we have done the report card, the changes have gotten less and less, luckily. But um, we did make a couple of changes this year. And one of them was to add a specific metric about um, sustainability in surgical environments. And one interesting observation is that the UK seems to be so much ahead of the US in that surgical, or is it not surgical, um, the healthcare sustainability uh, realm. Like, while if a school has any curriculum on this in the US, it tends to be more about the health consequences of climate change. In the UK, it tends to be more about sustainable healthcare. And I wonder about how you know, the structure of the health system might contribute to that in terms of who's paying for it. Yeah, so as you mentioned, other, it's, a, it's a value thing. Yeah, the, the other group you may want to contact, they're out of Canada. So Canada sort of hit this issue early on and it's a group of um, orthopedic and plastic surgeons and they do something called Wallant, W-A-L-A-N-T and it's a website it's now international and all the proceeds from their books and everything go towards climate change. And so these guys have been big backers of really looking at how things are done, where they're, what location, 
um, it might be, it, it addresses what you just said. It's, it came out of a need to have a different place to do procedures, but they've turned it around into a green initiative. Um, so that's a place to look. Super Thank interesting. you so much for your really. comments. Yeah, that's those are all great points. Um, especially interesting point too about you know who's paying for it and why the UK is maybe taking a more sustainable approach overall. Um, that's not something I've really thought of before, but that's great. We have a couple more questions in the chat. Maya, um, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah. I was wondering if you guys have worked with any undergraduate institutions or any pre-health training um, curriculum, and if you've evaluated any schools on how much undergraduates are being educated in climate change and health. Yeah, it's a great question, Maya. Um, all of the future directions and spinoffs of the report card that have emerged have been spearheaded by students in those disciplines. Um, and so I think having a report card for undergraduate institutions would be something we would be very open to and excited about. Um, but as you can imagine, having this sort of organization is a lot of work. And so it has to be someone kind of emerging from an undergraduate institution saying, I would like to leave this. Um, and we would be willing to support them, but we'll see if, if someone comes along. <laughs> If you need someone, I would be willing. <laughs> oh, okay. I wasn't sure what, where you were at in training. That would be great. Yeah. Email me. I'll put my email in the chat. Let's talk more. Yeah, that's great. We love that interdisciplinary connection there. That's awesome. Sounds like a great opportunity for you too, Maya. Um, Emily, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Carly. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, Within New Hampshire Healthcare Workers for Climate Action, we have a policy and advocacy working group. And one of the questions that we always get asked is what are some actions that one can take in the advocacy space? Um, and we obviously do a lot of community outreach as well. And I'm pretty sure you said that was one of the main or one of the criteria of the report card. Um, so I was just wondering if you could provide us with some examples as to what adv advocacy efforts you've seen students do um, or what if there's anything recommended or a community outreach. Yeah, so some of the metrics that we have in that category are having resources available for patients about um, the effects of climate change on health at clinical sites, as well as environmental toxins. And then also to what degree is your institution partnering with community organizations to advance climate and, and other planetary health efforts. And then this one is one that most schools do not score well on, um, but I think it's important to have in terms of setting the standard for what is possible with institutions. And that's to what degree do community organizations have the opportunity to provide insight onto what the institution's research agenda is. Um, and I think there are examples of that happening, like here at UCSF, um, we have the program for reproductive health in the environment. And I believe they have a community advisory board that helps shape their research agenda. And so I think that should be the standard for, for what all institutions are doing. Thank you for your question, Emily. Um, it looks like Jacqueline has a question. Jacqueline, are you in a position where you can unmute and share your question? Hi, I'm Jacqueline. Um, I'm a third year med student at University of Michigan, um, and I'm actually the leader of the local chapter of MS4SF here. Um, and so last year I helped out with the planetary health report card here. And like, unsurprisingly, we didn't score great. Um, <laughs> um, but something that I am like realizing more and more, especially as I'm in a leadership position at with like U of M's organization is it's, I think like the planetary health card is so, it's so helpful in getting like awareness spread and making people who are in positions of power be like, wow, like people really care about this, but it's really hard to see 
so far, like what results have come of it. And I know you mentioned resource banks, which I definitely am going to look into because like that sounds like something that we could use. Um, but I know that like leadership at my med school, they've joined some like research or research planetary health research focused organizations. And that's kind of been it. And I'm wondering like what you have seen as the most successful way to like push the needle and actually change our score from like a C plus to something better. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good question, Jacqueline. And I'm so excited that you were able to participate last year in the report card. Um, I think the changes that we've seen that have been the most impactful are from schools that have participated multiple years in a row. And I think Michigan just participated for the first time last year, right? So hopefully, um, as I was talking about earlier, like with multiple years, you'll see more progress. But um, a lot of the schools that have had multiple years in a row, they've formed like a planetary health task force or board. And then that has really been the um, organization or body that has pushed forward a lot of the change. And some of the changes we've seen that we've been most excited about are one, um, the planetary health report card led to a designated staff person for hospital sustainability being appointed. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then also like full on proposals for integrated climate curriculum being implemented at a couple of programs, or even if they're not all the way there, at least in progress for the upcoming couple of years. Gotcha. Thank you so much. That's super helpful. Those are definitely ideas that I want to bring to U of M. Yeah. And I just wanted to touch on the other piece of your question, which was hospital operations, um, because I think it's super, super important to address hospital sustainability. And obviously our healthcare system is a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Early on in the report card development, we were wondering about to what extent to include hospital sustainability in our metrics. Um, and you'll notice that fifth section is campus sustainability, not hospital sustainability. And the reason that we made that choice to exclude hospital sustainability, despite its importance, is because we were facing a lot of questions about um, like which hospitals do you include? Like every single medical school has different relationships with hospitals in their area. You might have four hospitals that you rotate through that are all affiliated to different degrees with the institution. And so how do you define that boundary? Um, we thought it would get a little bit complicated. And then also um, we felt like there were already good metrics out there to evaluate hospitals on sustainability, like healthcare without harm and, and practice green health among others. So we felt like we didn't have the expertise to develop metrics that were anywhere near what, what was already out there. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Jack, and thanks so much for your question. And it's exciting to see another medical student representing another medical school here. So thanks for joining us too. Uh, we do have another question in the chat from Linda. Linda, are you able to unmute and perhaps pose your question to the group? Certainly. Can you hear me? Yes. Carly, thank you for a great presentation. I can't wait to see if I can try to institute your report card at MCPHS University with three campuses, one in Boston, one in Worcester, and one in Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, this year, because of the benefits of this program and coming to all these lectures, I, I put a lecture together because I have, I'm faculty and I on on just this climate change in medicine, and it was so well received. And at the end of that lecture, I had the students go into small groups and advocate on all different levels what they would like to do. And uh, they were so excited and so passionate. We started a small group because not everybody has time in a busy curriculum, but um, they, it, and they're excited that maybe we'll go to middle schools. They, they didn't actually plant trees. Um, they approached administration. I did have support of the administration. I just wanted to thank you for doing this. And I look forward to um, doing some more work, but also with health system science. Have you heard about that? curriculum initiative from the AMA. It's putting a lot of the softer side of medicine, curriculum, you know, uh, structures and policies, economics, clinical informatics, public and population health value-based care 
I would think that, that climate change could be a part of that. Maybe having a conversation with the people that are promoting health system science might make it part more since they're already start initiating a curriculum change to chat with them. Um, I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, I feel like I've seen the acronym HSS thrown around a bit mm -hmm. um, in reference to this realm of curricula, but I wasn't sure what it stood for. I guess it's <laughs> health system science. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for your comment and question there, Linda. I see that Sudden has her hand raised. Sudden, are you um, in a position where you can unmute and ask your question to the group? Sure. Um, thanks so much, Jess, and thank you, Carly, for a really terrific presentation. Um, it seems like the ideal approach to embedding climate and health in the curriculum would probably be what's been described, which is really doing sort of a longitudinal curricular evaluation, identifying where climate fits into it, and then asking people to teach the curriculum. And thinking about that, I was thinking that it, a really pragmatic way to go about it, and I'm wondering if you have experience with this, is if you can get buy-in from the dean or from the faculty group that's in charge of the medical curriculum to simply require or strongly suggest that faculty bring climate into their teaching at whatever points they view appropriate within their field, and in that way, I think you get a really strong curriculum because it doesn't take much if you're teaching pulmonology, but you're not particularly interested in climate, which isn't true at our school. In fact, they are very interested. But if you're not, you do a quick literature search and you get involved in it, and then you throw in a couple of slides or you integrate points into your lecture. Do you have experience with schools that have done it that way, sort of having the faculty create the curriculum as they go along? Absolutely. Um, here at UCSF, we are working on integrating climate into the curricula, mm -hmm. but it's a, kind of in the way that you're describing, but also with student involvement. So um, we, like you mentioned, got support from the dean to integrate it throughout the curricula and then went ahead and contacting the individual course directors. Um, and rather than having the faculty self-identify areas in their lectures that might be good to integrate climate content. Um, we went ahead and went through all of the lectures and small groups that were part of our curriculum and identified for them as students where we thought it might fit in really well, trying to be as specific and tangible as possible in terms of what we're recommending. So for example, in the infectious disease block, which is the one that I poured through and identified opportunities for, I would say, oh, here's this um, case on gastroenteritis. And in the case description, they are talking about someone who went to a family reunion and like had some bad potato salad. Could we potentially modify that clinical vignette to be someone who experienced a hurricane in Puerto Rico? And then there was a lot of flooding and then that led to a bout of gastroenteritis. So it's not even like the content is that different. Um, right. It's not adding anything. It's just replacing a bit. Um, and often they've been really, really excited to do that. Or, you know, in the infectious disease lectures where we're talking about vector-borne diseases, can we just throw in this map of how the patterns have shifted over the last 10 years? Um, and we have found that approach to be helpful. One, because often the faculty don't really have a strong sense of where climate might fit in best. I think people are very quick to jump to like air pollution and pulmonary effects as their go-to example of, of climate affecting health. But as we all know, there's so much more than that. Um, and we conducted qualitative interviews with the course directors that we worked with to go through this process. And they reflected on how much they learned um, reforming their curricula in this way with us. And it was this adult learning type of process. Mm. That's great. Thank, thank you so much, Carly. Thanks. So then that was such a great question. I feel like I'm getting so many ideas for what Geisel's chapter of ms for sf can do. And so this discussion has been really exciting. Um, Carly, so, you know, we were talking before this and I mentioned I'm a second year student still in my preclinical uh, phase of education. And I'm wondering, 
um, either at UCSF or from you know, other schools who have submitted their planetary health report cards. Have you seen any um, attempts to try and integrate climate and health into the, uh, the clinical years and not just, you know, sort of limiting this education to the preclinical years? And um, do you have any ideas for what that could look like in a more clinical environment? That's a great question, Jess. I feel like that's the future of this movement. Um, how to translate what we're learning preclinically and all the ways that climate change affects health to our clinical interactions, how to bring this up with patients in a natural way, how to reform the clinical environment to be more sustainable. And I feel like that's the piece that's still missing. Um, I've heard from some people that, I forget which school it is, but they have a day in their clinical year, but in the didactic portion of their clinical year, um, that's devoted to air pollution and health, but I imagine it's still kind of that preclinical like didactic feel. Um, one thing that I would really like to see is sustainability QI projects being implemented. So here at UCSF, we have a required QI project that we have to complete during our first year, although I imagine at many other schools, it can show up in your third or fourth year. Um, and the faculty that we work with choose what project we are doing as a team. And often the faculty choose projects that are specific to their discipline. And it's just assigned to us, even if the discipline of our faculty is completely different from what we're interested in. So people can end up working on projects that they're not really passionate about. But I feel like sustainability is something that everybody can get behind and leads to really tangible outcomes um, that are very satisfying. And so we would love to have like templates for the faculty here to choose from of here's a sustainability QI project that you might consider implementing, even if you don't have a ton of background in doing this yourself. Um, and I think that would really help with not only um, giving people exposure to the quality improvement process, but then hopefully giving them a template for how they might um, implement the sustainability changes um, later in their clinical years and then in residency and beyond. Thank you so much for that answer. Yeah, I think that's, um, as you said, definitely sustainability is something that we should all be able to get behind. And I know the more time I spend in a clinical environment, I feel like I've been thinking a lot about, you know, waste a lot. And the unfortunate truth is that the healthcare system just does produce a lot of waste. And it's like something that's very visual and tangible and that we can see every day. So um, there's obviously a lot of areas. Um, that we can improve, but that's definitely one that comes to mind for maybe a potential project that Geisel's chapter can take on. Um, it looks like Maya does have another question. Maya, if you are interested in unmoving. Thank you for your questions, everyone, as well. This has been a great discussion here that we're having. This is not related to waste, though. That bothers me all the time when I'm in lab and like throwing out 5 million pipettes in an hour. Um, but more related to curriculum, I was wondering if any schools have used the textbook from um, Jay Lemery at Colorado um, and given that to faculty as like a template for how they can incorporate climate and health into their lectures or into their curriculum. That's a great point, Maya. Um, I'm familiar with Dr. J. Lemery and some of his incredible work, but I'm not familiar with this textbook and I haven't actually heard it be a template for curricular um, development, but I'm sure it would be a fantastic idea and a way to like really center what an ideal curriculum looks like. So I think we can bring that up as we present resources to the different teams that participate in the report card, for instance. Yeah, Maya, that's a great point. I don't know if you know, but Dr. Lemery was actually at Geisel, I think just last week presenting for our emergency medicine grand rounds. Um, so it's really funny that you brought him up. I don't know if you knew that, Maya, or? Yeah, no, Dr. Crockett invited me, so I went and it was like amazing, but awesome. I hadn't heard of the textbook before then. And I was like, why has, why has no one talked about this? So, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great idea. I think I'm, I actually also heard about that book for the first time at that Grand Rounds and I'm, I think I'm going to try and see if we can use some of our Geisel MS for SF funding to perhaps purchase a copy or two for the students. Um, yeah, uh, we don't have too much time left, but Carly, I'm wondering, um, I know you kind of mentioned at the beginning of your talk in the midst of the fires in California and like walking in the class and, you know, seeing such like a visual reminder of the harm that we're doing to our planet as the species. Um, was that the first time that you started thinking about this? Or I guess like what originally got you thinking about the connection between our the health of our environment and the health of us as humans? And what made you think that that was something you wanted to tie into your career moving forward as a medical student and physician? And I guess, have you thought, you know, I see that you're applying into internal medicine. Have you sort of thought about how you might tie that into your career moving forward? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a, a good practice round for interviews <laughs> that are coming up in a few weeks, as I imagine um, many people will want to know the same thing. But um, I have always been sort of sustainability outdoorsy minded. Um, I grew up in San Diego and my family loved being outside. Every vacation we ever had was centered around being outside, even if I was unappreciative of that as a teenager. <laughs> um, and there were a lot of wildfires that affected my community as well growing up. Um, my neighborhood was burned down twice and many of my friends lost their homes. So I think the intersections of climate and health and the visible reminders of um, climate change with all of the wildfire smoke were present pretty early on. And actually when I was applying to colleges, um, the reason I ended up choosing to go to Emory was because I, on a whim, just searched on Google, like most sustainable universities. And I had never heard of Emory before, but um, ended up picking Emory <laughs> because it showed up on one of those lists and going there, yeah, it was pretty sustainable. So it all worked out. Um, but there I studied anthropology and human biology and uh, worked a lot in the refugee and immigrant community of Clarkston, Georgia nearby, which is known as the Ellis Island of the South, given how diverse it is. And I was at clinic one day um, at the local community health center volunteering as a phlebotomist. And I was making chit chat with one of my patients um, who was a Syrian refugee. And she made this comment that really struck me about, well, you know, really it was the drought that caused all of this. And I went home that night and went down this internet rabbit hole about the Syrian refugee crisis and all of the underpinnings of the conflict there and how those roots could be traced back to climate change and drought. And it was like this aha moment of, wow, so many social issues are exacerbated by climate, whether that's like homelessness, racism, displacement. Um, and in the spirit of preventative medicine and an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, decided that in medical school, I wanted to make climate action my main focus going way upstream and hoping to mitigate a lot of the downstream inequities and downstream health effects of those inequities. So that was the, the backstory even before getting to medical school and being in the wildfire, um, feeling that disconnect with the curriculum. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's definitely very powerful. And um, I think, you know, many of us probably have similar backgrounds in terms of how we sort of came to this realization that human health is inexplicably linked with the health of our planet. Um, and it is, I don't know, I guess sometimes I just feel a little bit alarmed and overwhelmed to think that um, these, you know, extreme weather events that are caused by climate change are really just going to be increasing in frequency. And, you know, you mentioned refugee populations and thinking about how that displacement of people is really just going to increase as time goes on. It can be really overwhelming. So I guess another question I can pose to you, if um, that's okay, is, you know, integrating this work into medical school and um, I guess for our pre-med listeners as well, when we're already 
so strapped for time and often stressed with the content of our classes and like meeting all the demands of a regular medical student, how do you like continue to hold on to that drive and purpose? And how do you also, um, I guess, not get discouraged or how do you remain optimistic and not, um, I don't want to say depressed, but you know, it can be such a bleak outlook sometimes. How do you sort of keep a, a productive mindset with it is what I'll say. Yeah, it's a great question. And I'll say, you know, some, some weeks are better than others, but two of the things that give me hope, one is that we have all the technology we need right now to fix this. It's not like we're waiting for some miracle to save us. Like we have autonomy. We just need to change our systems to embrace that technology that's already there, which is you know, easier said than done, but it's not like an impossible task. And then two is that this is not like nuclear war. This is not all or nothing. Um, what gives me hope is that and gives me purpose is that even if collectively all of our efforts can mitigate 0.1 degrees of warming, 0.2 degrees of warming, that is hundreds of thousands of lives. Like that means something. Um, so the fact that it's not like if we surpass 1.5 or two degrees that it's all a wash, every, every piece counts. And so even if I can't be part of like the whole solution, if I can be part of a fraction of a degree of a solution, I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think you've done a lot, you know, starting the planetary health report card, you've obviously gotten so many individuals and so many schools involved. And, um, you know, it's only been going since 2019. So it's really only been a couple of years. And I feel like already, at least at Geisel, you know, we've only done it for two years, but we have seen some progress and hopefully we'll just continue to see more positive progress moving forward. And I know that this conversation for me tonight has been very inspiring and sort of grounding and reminding me of why this is something I choose to care about so deeply. I feel like it's easy to get overwhelmed with school and other responsibilities, but this has been a very grounding conversation for me. So I just wanna thank you, Carly, for your time and presenting to us here tonight and taking the time to answer all of the many questions we've been sort of barraging you with. Um, does anybody else have any last comments or thoughts? Yes, this is Carl Cooley. Um, I, I just to expand on your question about uh, what inspires you and gives you gives you hope. I just want to say that that the uh, work that Carly's done and the ways in which others like you, Jess and Maya and and students in general are engaging in this issue with such passion and energy is something that gives me hope as someone at more or less the other end of a of a a medical career. Um, uh, I'm just um, um, well inspired and and uh, and so grateful. So um, thank you for this this presentation and um, just thanks for doing a masterful job.